Cheers. My name is Julia Serdelic and I'm a Max Weber Fellow in the academic year 2014-2015 and I'll be conducting today's interview. It is the utmost pleasure and honor that I can introduce today's speaker, Professor Klaus Offe, who gave a Max Weber lecture yesterday, which was entitled Doubt and Road, the Discourse on Secular Stagnation and the Social in the Social in the Social Sciences. Um, Professor Klaus Offe teaches political uh, sociology at the Hertie School of Governance. He completed his PhD at the University of Frankfurt and his habilitation at the University of Constance. In Germany, he has held chairs for political science and political sociology in, at the University of Bielefeld, Bremen, as well as uh, Humboldt University of Berlin. He has worked as fellow or, and visiting professor at, among others, the Institutes of Advanced Studies in Stanford, Princeton, Australian National University, as well as Harvard University, the University of California and Berkeley, and the, the New School University, New York. At the present moment, Professor Offe is a Fernand Brodel uh, Senior Fellow at the European University Institute, and that's why we have a pleasure also to meet him. Professor Offe's bibliography is impressive, to say the least. Uh, not just because of the broad scope of the topics that he's dealing with, from distributive justice to migration regimes as well as economic crisis, solidarity and so on, but also due to in-depth approach that he takes in his writings and presentations. Uh, so Professor Offa, my first question is connected to your lecture that you gave yesterday, the Max Weber lecture, uh, and it connects to the ambiguity, as you say, of economic growth, uh, if we see it as a remedy for economic crisis. <coughs> so I wanted to kindly ask you if you could summarize the most essential points why economic growth is ambiguous and why you doubt that it cannot be or shall not be seen as a medicine remedy for economic crisis. Well, um, there are two uh, waves in the literature that I think are worth taking notice of beyond the academic uh, economics. One is, uh, and the earlier literature coming out since the late 90s, which uh, come under the general title Beyond GDP. Uh, and that's uh, the message of that literature is uh, GDP is less and less uh, suitable as a measure of progress and uh, uh, happiness, right? I mean, the the post-war boom period, uh, the terms of economic growth and individual as well as collective need satisfaction, happiness, sat satisfaction is like. Uh, uh, meaning more or less the same. And the two have diverged. And this is widely demonstrated uh, whether or not uh, uh, the uh, GDP uh, per capita is uh, X or X times 2 uh, does not make a big difference in the general satisfaction of population. That's the first set of literature and uh, the uh, a number of prominent, prominent names, including Amartya Sen and others working on it. The second has to do with the hypothesis of secular stagnation. And that is an idea that came out after uh, 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 the crisis, uh, which is still going on. I mean, it's not a, a cyclical event of 2008, which was over in 2010. It has repercussions and long-term consequences that are still with us. And the argument here, made by people such as Larry Summers uh, and others, is that um, maybe uh, capitalist democracies have reached a stage of indebtedness, and of uh, financial nation, which uh, they are unable to extricate themselves from. And we have uh, to live in a permanent uh, condition of zero growth, uh, high unemployment, and the loss of a notion of uh, 
progress or development or desirable directions of change. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I think that is the second, uh, uh, which I think is uh, right and symptomatic. And the, 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 uh, the, the point I have uh, emphasized is that the conventional means of fiscal, economic and monetary policies, these instruments have been blunted. They do not work any longer. They do not lead to a recovery and a return to no normal. But instead, <clears throat> we have a level of indebtedness of households, enterprises, and states that uh, itself prevents the renormalization of conditions. That is basically, and how do people respond to this? And the proposal of green growth or a post capitalist uh, economy uh, based on entitlements rather than. Uh, full employment and, and so uh, this is an entire range of responses that people have proposed and have been briefly discussed. Thank you very much for your answer and I'm moving with my next question to today's workshop that we have right. with you. Uh, and one of the texts that we read, of one of your text articles that we read for today's workshop was Europe and Trap. Does the EU have yes. the politi political <laughs> capacity to overcome the current crisis? And here you discuss concepts like solidarity, democratic deficit, which connected to poverty of party politics, and you connected to the uh, economic crisis, which is somehow a new <coughs> phenomenon. It's like very, very decisive phenomena. And my question here would be: uh, when we look at the recent changes in European EU politics, especially in Greece, mm -hmm. um, with the victory of Syriza, how does that affect the picture that you're talking about and you're deciding okay. in the text? I mean, the, uh, okay, to go a step back in history, uh, after uh, the, I mean, difficult to explain mistake happens to admit an economy like Greece to the Eurozone. This was a mistake from the beginning. Um, after this happened, uh, a divergence in European, in the Eurozone, uh, became manifest and it could not be bridged by the structural funds and modernization uh, transfers that were paid from the north to the south. It was much too limited. So the crisis brought to light a <clears throat> deep split within the European Union. And contrary to expectations from the 80s, it was not a split between the old and the new member states. It was uh, more a split within the Eurozone between the prosperous net exporters and uh, the ailing uh, net importers with high employment, uh, unemployment. With high. Uh, anyway, so that, this was uh, the situation and the response of the North to the uh, suffering uh, of much of the South, as well as in the case of uh, Ireland, the far west, was you must do two things. First, you must practice austerity. You have to get rid of your debt. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, uh, any support and financial assistance that we, the Northerners, the core Europeans will extend to you will have to uh, uh, well that that's, uh, the assistance is conditional austerity. Second, you must become a modern economy. That is, you must have flexible labor market <coughs> and um, eliminate all kinds of uh, uh, privileges and. Uh, tax loopholes and, and so This may all be for the better, in particular structural uh, reforms, although certainly not all of them, but in a time of crisis, austerity and structural reforms as a condition of financial assistance turned out to be a poisonous uh, medicine, right? And uh, uh, it's 
very clear that uh, uh, the Greek uh, uh, mobilization that led to the uh, electoral victory of Syriza, uh, as well as uh, mobilizations in other countries, in particular Spain, the Podemos uh, movement or the M15 movement from which the uh, uh, that this, uh, these movements uh, stand for the protest against the force feeding of poisonous medicine that uh, the European uh, Central Bank, the European Commission, the I and after support, Troika, had forced these countries to adopt. And this is, an, uh, I see this as an act of protest in a desperate situation that prevails in much uh, of Greece, not just the income situation, the employment situation, but also the health system uh, and the education system are in a uh, terrible uh, financial uh, condition uh, and the European assistance has not helped uh, to um, to improve that situation. In fact, European assistance having the consequence of, of uh, incredible indebtedness of these uh, southern periphery countries has served to bail out German, French banks, uh, rather than help the population, which is not, not going to. So this is um, a solid uh, response of despair, of anger, of frustration, of protest, uh, that led to the almost 40% of the series uh, and the formation of the new government. However, um, and it is today that we, we are talking, February 19, 2015. Um, the uh, position that uh, uh, the Visa, uh, Syriza uh, government has taken towards European authorities is widely perceived as purely confrontational, a chicken game where they uh, and I think that is wrong. They think, uh, they think that uh, they are not only serving their own advantage, they are also putting the European Union on the right course. And on an, uh, uh, and Vavaflak uh, Vav is the, the finance minister, certainly thinks uh, that way. However, it is not read that way in the rest of Europe. It is, it is uh, read as a um, selfish manipulation of the situation rather than a proposal for reform. And, and these different... Re and and uh, the Greek government had no opportunity or has missed the opportunity, if it had one, to form a alliance with other member states of the European Union and the Eurozone, particularly those that find themselves in a similar situation. It is an entirely a, a confrontation of 1 to 18. Right? And that makes the, the, the strategic situation very, uh, very difficult. And uh, uh, a total victory is not to be expected, although we know it within the next few days, uh, and a very difficult situation uh, of compromise. But of course, uh, the damage that a non-agreement can cause, a non-compromise can cause, is incalculable and uh, uh, giant. Uh, and uh, that, of course, should motivate uh, compromise on the part of the partners of Greece. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, we are moving a little bit towards theoretical questions mm -hmm. because uh, in your texts uh, and articles and books you also discuss 
theoretical concepts uh, about distributive and redistributive justice. And my question here would be, how do you see the idea of uh, an universal basic income? So do you see uh, okay. it as a possible solution to many questions we have discussed before? Yeah, um, I mean, it is a um, uh, consensus that uh, what is lacking and what is necessary for a uh, recovery in uh, Europe. Anything that comes close to the idea of full employment and, and, and growth or even sustainability. Or, uh, okay, all this depends on, on effective demands. And uh, given the level of indebtedness, indebtedness of both private households and uh, states, this demand is going to shrink. But we need a mechanism by which uh, demand can be maintained, but also in the interest of uh, social justice and the uh, uh, fight against uh, poverty or the alleviation of poverty, we need um, economic guarantees that the labor market itself is very unlikely to generate. We have the conditions of precariousness, we have the conditions of long-term high-level unemployment, and that is no uh, surprise in a situation where you have a long-term recession plus an effective increase of the global labor supply uh, uh, of uh, virtually 100% within 10 years. Right? <laughs> through the end of the Iron Curtain and through the uh, very inexpensive means of communication and transportation, uh, European textiles are, as well as European used computers are manufactured somewhere else, right? And much of them in India and China. Right? Mm -hmm. There is, uh, so that means uh, a textile industry, but also electronic manufacturing does not really exist anymore in Europe and that costs jobs and so on. So, uh, as a, I mean, for a long time, I'm a, I'm a um, supporter of uh, uh, proposals for a basic income. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that this is to be taken seriously as a very, very expensive uh, social policy arrangement that will also push to the side a number of other products, so, uh, so, uh, social policy. So we have to calculate this very carefully, what we can do uh, here, but it has the dual advantage of, uh, and that is essential for any notion of social progress and justice, to put a floor underneath the income scale. No one should, uh, whether or not he is in the labor market or not, mm -hmm. should uh, have to live on uh, an income that is less than such and such. And it should be unconditional of family status, of wealth status, of uh, labor market status, uh, of readiness to participate. So it should be a citizen right to income to prevent poverty. This is one side. The other side, the other argument for basic income has to do with restoring effective demand mm -hmm. uh, and thereby leading, as it has done in these great Indian and South African Namibia experiments for uh, uh, basic income. With basic income. Uh, it has stabilized uh, demand and thereby in these underdeveloped economic situations uh, contributed to a upturn of the business cycle. Why should the same happen in our uh, uh, European uh, context. So, social justice plus, plus uh, demands uh, expansion uh, are, the, uh, are the arguments that they have. Weighty 
counter arguments and very deep problems of uh, getting the financial uh, resources in, into place, which uh, basic income re require. I think this is uh, still an idea that uh, uh, will become and is currently the process of becoming popular among a great variety of policy uh, makers and policy analysts, and I think it will stay around. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, let's continue also with another theoretical question. Uh, you're often associated with uh, Ruben Habermas uh, as you were mm -hmm. his student, and I would like to ask you how do you evaluate uh, his work today? from your today's perspective, but also how do you think and how, in your view, what do you think about categorization as uh, some works? For example, sometimes it was, uh, sometimes it was, uh, your, your work was categorized as Marxist. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering, uh, what do you think about labels as Marxism, neo-Marxism, and also post-Marxism that was mm -hmm. advocated by Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe and so on, and what's your Position towards such uh, such uh, uh, okay. categorization. Well, um, uh, it is clear that the old Frankfurt School, uh, the generation of Horkheimer Adorno, uh, was very strongly uh, influenced and uh, by uh, some uh, elements of classical Marxism. Uh, namely a, a theory of class conflicts, um, but without uh, any um, uh, philosophy or history. It was class conflict that was central and at the same time the answer to the question why doesn't, doesn't that lead to socialism or communism, something, or something that has to do with culture. Culture prevents conflict to translate. So this, this is a, a very simplistic mm -hmm. reformulation of what the older generation uh, did. I think the, um, the younger generation, those born uh, in the late 20s, early 30s, and uh, Jürgen Habermas is clearly uh, by far the most prominent representative of that generation. Uh, they would also give up the um, notion of uh, transition to socialism, you know. Uh, so, even be further remote from, um, uh, from classical Marxism, but also they would give up uh, the notion of class conflict uh, that is disruptive or that needs to be uh, um, repressed mm -hmm. by cultural uh, uh, configurations of, of capitalism that was always at the center of the interests of people like uh, Adorno and Hawking. Uh, instead, the assumption was that a uh, post-war institutional order of uh, uh, social market economy would be capable of containing the conflicts in ways uh, that uh, uh, were contributing to the promotion of notions of social justice, which was the case for a long time, right? But the, so the interventionist welfare state on a Keynesian basis a strong economic management, strong co-determination, uh, societal corporatism, you know, these are all elements of a what, what the post-war uh, uh, theorists thought uh, is a stable order. Now, in uh, the great turning point of uh, Western economic history, which was somewhere in the first half of the 70s. Um, let's say the first oil shock, which was November 1973. Uh, uh, exploded that confident assumption about the 
the orderly and balanced and interventionist and controlled uh, course of social and economic affairs. What we have seen since then, uh, and through the demise of state socialism and uh, through uh, the post-Cold War crisis, is a, a deep uh, disruption of, uh, of uh, conception of social order, be it international order, uh, or be it uh, social economic uh, order, culminating in the crisis of 2008, right? So the, uh, and, uh, the people of the Frankfurt School were in the process, and I would include myself in a very indirect way, uh, they were in the process of studying these changes and the uh, increasing unlikelihood of a stable social order, mm -hmm. and trying uh, to look at the renewed conflict and uh, uh, not necessarily but also class conflict uh, that emerged uh, after this uh, trente glorieuse, the, 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 the quiet and glorious 20 years or 30 years of post-war history were over, right? And mm -hmm. mid-70s is the turning point. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's move a little bit further uh, with the next text that we were reading for today's uh, workshop that had to do with migration regimes. And if yes. may I quote uh, from your text, uh, you're talking a lot about uh, uh, integration as well as an interesting uh, integration of migrants and so on. And one thing that you said in your text, I'm quoting here, even if borders could be effectively sealed to the flow of newcomers, the stock of residents with foreign roots and their integration would remain as the major challenge for public policy. So you gave a critical uh, evaluation of the notion of integration in this case, mm -hmm. text. But my question would be, what is your, because that remains a major challenge, so what is your vision of integration of not newcomers, but maybe those who do not possess citizenship yet? I mean, how do you see uh, this dilemma? Okay. Uh, this, this article was written for a, um, uh, in Australia and for an uh, Australian um, uh, audience and uh, they have their own experience with migration policy and uh, I said uh, let's review the European experience in the light of... Uh, uh, okay, so one, one important thing uh, I think is that uh, uh, citizenship does not stand at the end of an integration process, but itself becomes a vehicle of uh, integration. Mm -hmm. so, so you arrive, then you get residence right, then you get citizen rights, mm -hmm. and eventually you participate in the labor market, in uh, public life, and uh, in uh, uh, education in the same way and using having the same opportunities as the local nationals uh, and, uh, and the population. It is a, a process that uh, in which uh, citizen itself, citizenship itself can help. Uh, that was uh, the notion. It's not a reward at the end after you have integrated. It is a vehicle of, uh, of uh, integration, and that means, and I have looked at the, I mean, as uh, people at uh, the European uh, University Institute have done so, mm -hmm. the leaders in the, in the, in the field, like Anna, uh, 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 what are the uh, means by which the opportunities of migrants can be equalize to those uh, of the local uh, uh, population in terms of education, in terms of language, in terms of rights, in terms of access to the labor market and success in the labor market and in terms of political representation. Mm -hmm. uh, how can these uh, uh, opportunity structures be 
uh, uh, transformed so as to become more migrant friendly. Right? That, that is the, uh, the uh, that is the idea, and uh, remarkably, uh, in some cases, for some groups, for some periods of time, it has worked quite well, uh, and uh, uh, even the very uh, very discriminatory conditions under which. Uh, people uh, uh, from the Balkans, but also from Italy, from Morocco, from uh, Portugal, Spain uh, came, have uh, made the second and third generation, uh, I mean, full social citizens, not just legal because of passport, but social in the sense having the same opportunities uh, in all these uh, dimensions. And uh, I've simply uh, tried to to, uh, to answer the question: uh, uh, how how can that happen? How can that be generalized? And I do think that education and, in particular, language, are a uh, uh, important answer or element of the answer. Thank you. Uh, now you mentioned uh, also. Uh Yugoslav situation and yes. the conflict. Uh, I would like to relate a little bit uh, to yes, that yes, as well, uh, because like we can see like this uh, many many patterns as you mentioned uh, in the work in the workshop that we have many patterns of migration. So it's not just yes. clear cut. So we have asylum seekers and so on, and like we can see that this is not a game of equality when it comes to migrants, especially when we see, for example, migrants, for example, from Kosovo who are always in fear of being deported on one hand, on the other hand, they cannot, the ones who want to come, do not have the rules, do not have the ability to come because mm. of the mm. visa uh, uh, limitations and so on. Yes, I mean, there, there is a uh, the hierarchy, I, I think, there are seven groups, you know, mm. you know the, the, the lowest group, those with the least opportunities and least chance to acquire opportunities are so-called illegal. Uh, 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 migrants that, uh, um, uh, I mean, the better term is undocumented, mm -hmm. uh, some papier in, 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 uh, in French, uh, undocumented, they do not have papers, right? Mm -hmm. Or they have reason to throw away the papers they have. And so this, this, this is the, the lower end. The upper end are these uh, the ethnic co-nationals mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, uh, in the German case, have lived in the Soviet Union, or in the Hungarian case, have lived in Serbia, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, have now special status of being invited back with full social security, uh, and, and so the, in between, we have uh, asylum seekers, uh, we have uh, legally recognized refugees. We have uh, 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 temporary workers, seasonal workers, we have permanent workers, uh, uh, migration, we have family members and so on. So there's a whole scale of differentiated mm -hmm. rights and uh, opportunities. Um, and uh, 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 member states have um, in their uh, legislation on residence rights and on citizenship rights uh, found very different ways to accommodate these uh, these uh, uh, different groups. I think an important breakthrough is the recognition of dual citizenship. Uh, so uh, allow to acquire citizenship here while keeping this, uh, the citizenship of origin. Another important uh, I think new thought in the debate is the thought that people who come here uh, are people who, if they are skilled and trained and bring human capital, will be missing mm -hmm. at the place of their origin. Right? And, and uh, the question may be asked, isn't it sheer robbery of human capital that, uh, for instance, Germans benefit from when uh, uh, doctors from 
Slovakia, mm -hmm. uh, en masse, coming to Germany to work in Bavaria, twice the salary, the, the, the uh, uh, degrees uh, more or less recognized, whereas, I mean, uh, hospitals in mm -hmm. Bratislava have difficulties, uh, to to recruit the staff, right? Because yes, yes. and and you have this, of course, on a large scale, nurses in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, they trained with means from uh, Europe, mm -hmm. and then once they are trained, once they have the certificate, they work for fourfold their salary in London, right? And the next generation of nurses will have to be. Uh, train to take care of the local. I mean, they are very serious, not just legal but economic problems of of uh, advantage and disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And Germany prides itself uh, uh, of uh, being open-minded to skilled uh, um, uh, migrants. Uh, no wonder because they save a lot of money they, they training yeah. these people, and they cause a lot of damage. By uh, uh, allowing these people to come in, and that means they leave from their the place of origin. Um, so, I mean, I have like a lot of questions connected to because like, we can talk about blue card directive here, exactly, so, exactly. and so on, which is like really but, questionable. Uh, I mean, the, the, the revealing yeah. and and uh, in a very shameless statement of the former German Chancellor uh, Gerhard Schröder was. Mm -hmm. We must divide the uh, migrants in two groups. There are people whom we need, and there are people who need us. Right? And uh, the implication, of course, is we need to maximize the first category mm -hmm. and to minimize the second category, which both of which will involve economic mm -hmm. advantage right? uh, uh, for us. So it is a very uh, interest guidance uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, policy area that under the cover of uh, humanitarian concerns for poor people and so on mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's really worse than this uh, taking place here at the EUI on a large scale it's really worse to explore the dynamics of this policy area mm -hmm. as yeah. you're also doing your work uh, so my very last question is connected also to uh, the talk that you gave at the Mobility and Crisis uh, Conference and you also spoke about post-national and here I'm also taking one of uh, uh, your quotes from your text yes. about citizenship. So uh, you say that inherited citizenship is on average highly consequential for a person's lifelong well-being mm -hmm. and is arguably one of the most consequential assets on liabilities of a person. So, I mean, my question would be, how is the role of citizen uh, changing when we're entering you know, the period where uh, borders, national borders are uh, permeable and also we have this post-national character, as you would say? Yeah, but I mean, citizenship, the right to have rights, right, that, uh, is uh, a, a basic determinant of your uh, the opportunities and risks uh, likely. If you if you are a citizen, you have the right to be here. You have the right to uh, social and, and uh, uh, police and health protection uh, that non-citizens have to a limited extent or, or not at all. Uh, so it all depends on the modes of acquisition of citizenship. How you, how you can acquire it. What, what is the quid pro quo? What is the price that you have to pay? The entry fee as a to uh, to citizenship, and here uh, uh, we can look back over the last 20 years or so to a very dynamic change in, in Europe. Citizenship law have changed and liberalized everywhere, partly under the demographic crisis that we experience in the uh, countries of destination, such as Germany or Italy, mm -hmm. for example. You need uh, uh, additional population in order to pay for the pension uh, and, uh, and so on. So uh, citizenship is uh, uh, the key variable by which economic but also humanitarian and, and, and social interests and concerns 
are being balanced and uh, you have of course a very strong uh, 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 set of negative attitudes about the, the cheap access to citizenship. So ethnic uh, nationalism and xenophobia uh, and uh, uh, concerns about uh, the foreigner mm -hmm. interfering with our condition is a very common phenomenon. Uh, but uh, I mean, to end on a on a positive note, uh, it is well known in the social sciences and I a mean, massive demonstration wherever you look at this question. People are more opposed to migrants, to foreigners, uh, the less they are exposed to their to experience with them. So if you have, as in the former GDR, very few people who are not, the former GDR was the ethnically most homogeneous society in Europe. Right? You had 1% uh, Soviet friends, they were in the barracks, and you had 1% Vietnamese and uh, Angola Bay, uh, and Mozambique base uh, uh, guest workers, they were in a, in a different kind of barracks. Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, so and, and under these conditions, the lack of exposure to, I mean, people who are brought up in a different language, mm -hmm. or people who look differently, or people who have a different religion, or uh, who dress differently, mm -hmm. or whatever, lack of exposure to difference leads to these uh, very massive, still remaining uh, xenophobic um, uh, attitudes. Whereas the exposure makes people more liberal, more open-minded and more tolerant. Uh, and uh, uh, the ultimate, the ultimate uh, divide, and that is on this positive note, uh, the ultimate divide right? is not language, it is not phenotypical appearance or race, uh, it is uh, not ethnicity, but it seems to be religion. Okay. And that is what uh, is uh, uh, on the table in the uh, question, as it is phrased in Germany. Does Islam belong to our country, or does it not? Right? And that is really a sensitive issue: the role of Islam. Uh, and uh, it is on the agenda, and will stay there for a while. Thank you very much for your interview. Okay, thank, thank you, you for, for, for your question. Thank you. Okay. Oh.